Welcome to the SDG LearnCast with me, Pauline Duman. In every episode, I bring insightful conversations around the subject of sustainable development and learning, helping us all to achieve a sustainable future. In this episode, we will look into the pressing threats faced by two of our planet's vital ecosystems. The Amazon rainforest, often referred to as the lungs of the earth, and the Congo Basin, the ecological heart of Africa. Recent reports from The Guardian and Earth Insight paint a concerning picture, indicating not only a potential boom in areas allocated for oil and gas extraction in Africa, but also pinpointing the relentless expansion of oil industries in the Amazon and Congo Basin, compromising their lush forests and diverse communities. The stakes are high with millions of lives, both human and wildlife, hanging in the balance. Join us in this episode as we untangle the complex web of fossil fuel expansion and conservation efforts, underscoring the immediate need for global decarbonization and the preservation of both ecological and cultural treasures. Our guest for this episode is Mr. Tyson Miller, the Executive Director of Earth Insight. He will share his thoughts on the need for 21st century solutions that put people, nature, and climate stability first. Tyson, welcome to the SDG LearnCast. Why is oil and gas expansion in the Congo Basin and the Amazon rainforest so critical right now? Unfortunately, this particular moment is critical because of a variety of geopolitical dynamics and concerns in play. Obviously, with the war in Ukraine, there's less access to fossil fuels. There are a range of pressures specifically on the African continent. Exploration blocks represent about four times the size of current production blocks. So there's a potential of about a massive increase in oil and, and gas expansion. In terms of where those blocks are located, about 90% of all tropical forest, primary forests on the continent are in the Congo Basin. In the Congo Basin region, there's about 70 million hectares, an area about twice the size of Germany, that are in current oil and gas production blocks. What's in play in the Congo, in the Democratic Republic of the Congo, is illustrative of the broader threats in other countries. Recently, there are more than 30 oil and gas blocks that have been put up for auction and hydrocarbon ministers and others are really trying to find companies that will come in and engage in oil and gas expansion in the world's second largest rainforest. Massive amounts of biodiversity, over 150 distinct ethnic groups call the Congo Basin home. 32 million people or 20% of populated places in the Congo Basin countries are now in oil and gas blocks. So it's right now is a really pivotal time where there can be alternative, different development pathways that Congo Basin countries choose as opposed to what we've seen historically. Also, three quarters of the Congolese people are living on less than $2 a day. And despite the huge minerals and reserves and potential for renewables, as you also mentioned, what's also important here is that they don't benefit from these operations. How does the economic disparity in the Congo impact the region's approach to oil and gas development? There has been some really interesting mapping by a group called Resource Matters. And what they've done is they've done an analysis looking at what individuals and communities need in the region for true energy security. And it's not expanding oil and gas development in the GRC or other nations. Most of that, if not all of that oil would be for export market. And so in terms of what's needed locally to address sustainability, you know, sustainable development goals and regional needs are economic activity that's grounded in the principles of the bioeconomy. So ways in which communities can have expanded rights and expanded territories and community owned forest to essentially ensure the integrity of the ecosystem, local livelihoods that can enable the forest to stay intact and without big industry coming in essentially exploiting the region for export markets. And so if regional development is really the end goal, fossil fuel expansion is in the path forward. What do you mean by bioeconomy? 
it's going to obviously differ in different regions. There are a range of indigenous nationalities and federations who are developing life plan for how different types of economic activities can move forward without essentially fragmenting the forest or bringing in large industrial activity. So in terms from a solution standpoint, there's a lot more that's needed for local organizations to define what type of economic activities they intend to move forward on while maintaining the integrity and the health of the ecosystem. There are also significant oil and gas expansion threats in the Amazon. Can you explain what's at stake in more detail? I've been working on this issue for about five years or so. And, and one thing that's really concerning, especially as someone who lives in the United States, is about the majority of the exports of oil out of the Western Amazon, which is where most of the oil is exported, is destined for the United States. So about two thirds of that oil. And the majority of that goes to refineries in California. California has a really significant climate leadership goals and a reputation for environmental leadership, but as consuming just a huge amount of oil from the Amazon. In fact, in California, where I'm originally from, about a one in nine gallons on average pump in state comes from the Amazon. So similar to uh, the Congo Basin region, there's just a massive amount of undisturbed tropical forests or primary and prairie forests, about 65 million hectares or an area twice the size of Poland now overlap with existing or planned oil and gas block. And just like in the Congo Basin region, there's just a tremendous amount of indigenous and local communities and cultural diversity. So there's over 500 distinct indigenous nationalities called the Amazon Basin home. And unfortunately, there's about 25 million hectares of indigenous territories that are now in either production or exploration blocks. So this is really highly problematic. In fact, there's about 12 million people living in about 10,000 villages or towns or 20% of populated places in Amazonia or in oil and gas blocks. The Amazon basin as a whole is in the, on average, if you're looking at it in aggregate, it's in the midst of a tipping point crisis. And the ecosystem needs to have 75 to 80% intactness in order to generate its own rainfall and to avoid feedback loops that kick in that would force the transition of the ecosystem from a tropical rainforest to a tropical savanna. And just like in the Congo, the first cut is the deepest. So the big industry that comes in, like oil and gas mining and other big industries, agribusiness, when that infrastructure comes in, you've got a gateway to deforestation. And it's really highly concerning that the two forest bases that are most biotopically diverse regions on the planet that we're facing the degrees of oil expansion. You've painted a stark picture for these two regions, the Congo Basin and Amazon rainforest. Can you highlight other areas facing similar threats? Before I get into that, what's, what really has struck me is that the International Energy Agency has stated that to stay within the Paris Agreement threshold of 1.5 degrees Celsius, no further fossil fuel expansion will take place. But if you look at current forecasts, a 2030 government expansion plans would lead to about 240% more coal, 57% more oil, and 71% more gas than would be consistent with a 1.5 degree threshold. And so that's affecting whether it's the Amazon or the Congo Basin or other regions. That's just, that's what we have to get out in front of collectively. Fossil fuel expansion, it's just not compatible with progress on any of the SDGs and with our need for climate stability. You would think these, what's happening in the world's two largest rainforest basins or what the threat of oil and gas expansion is, is illustrative of what we're facing globally. And, uh, one area in particular is the Coral Triangle region. And so this is the most biodiverse marine ecosystem on the planet. We just did a cursory analysis of the oil and gas expansion threat in the Coral Triangle. And we found that there's over 300 oil and gas blocks, production and exploration that overlap or that are in the Coral Triangle region. And that about half of all the corals within the Coral Triangle are in these oil and gas blocks. We did do a deeper dive for the uh, Banking on Climate Chaos report of the LNG or the fossil gas build out in the Batagas province uh, in the Philippines, the Verde Island Passage, and found that there's all sorts of concern and what that might mean for increased shipping intensity. There was a recent spill there you're going to have likelihood of increased spills, but also 
that increase in shipping intensity and all the coastal development of the facilities on the coastline has the potential to vastly impact the corals, the mangroves, the seagrasses that are all vital for a really rich marine ecosystem. It sounds grim, but where do you see hope? What are the 21st century solutions that put people, nature, and climate first? And can you elaborate on what these solutions might look like? We all need to be focused on, well, having clear eyes and a clear sense of what the threats are so we can avoid going down certain pathways or be prepared to counter those threats. But having momentum and creative, disruptive, bold solutions, momentum for these solutions out in the world is absolutely vital. I'll just mention that in both the reports we produced, Congo and the Crosshairs, and then the Crisis Point, both looking at the oil and gas expansion threats to the Congo Basin region and the Amazon, and certainly profile a range of different solutions that are out there in the core part of, of our analyses. I'm struck by a few solutions, frameworks that are out there in the world that are really gaining momentum and steam. One of those is the Fossil Fuel Non-Proliferation Treaty find more about that at the website fossilfueltreaty.org. It's gaining steam with island nations calling for other nations to commit to no uh, fossil fuel expansion. A really bold, simple, clear solution. At the at COP15, there was the launch of the prim- moratorium on industrial activity in primary four, which is vital. We need to be focusing on areas that have already been impacted, sustainable intensification, and in exchange for, or in addition to drawing lines in the sand around the areas that are intact. A lot of the oil and gas development and oil and gas development, let's say, go back to the Western Amazon uh, in Ecuador specifically, but in a range of other nations, that staying back loans is driving a lot of the industrial expansion. And so a widespread condition debt forgiveness in exchange for keeping oil and gas on the ground and expanding protected areas could be a, a really pivotal solution. I think to the extent that banks and financial institutions are really out in front and saying, hey, we won't commit to any fossil fuel expansion is key. You've seen a number of those commitments that they need to be strong and without loopholes. And when I was working on the campaign in the Amazon, there were ING and BNP Paribas were a couple of banks that made those commitments for the globally, but also for the Amazon region. If we look at history, we can see especially like in Brazil, when they were able to cut their deforestation rates pre-Bolsonaro by 80%, a lot of that was because developed nations were providing resources in the form of payments for ecosystem services that enabled some of the new policies and code, a whole next generation of what payments for ecosystem services looks like is really critical. And honestly, carbon markets have been critiqued and criticized for good reason for quite a lot of time for not being as effective as they need to be. But there's a lot of potential with respect to high integrity carbon markets where you can leverage those dynamics and the interest and the desire of companies to offset their impacts and their emissions through carbon markets. Those can be done in the right way. And the UN Secretary General Gutierrez's acceleration agenda, there's a lot there that needs to be unpacked and prioritized out of the range, the broad scope of what he is calling for. Shifting subsidies is a massive, bold, and disruptive solution, but shifting subsidies from the fossil fuel sector to the renewable sector would enable a just energy transition. It would enable the tens of billions, if not trillions, that are going to subsidizing the industry now, but be leveraged for what's needed and what's next. Putting a price on carbon, an effective carbon tax as a disincentive has been talked about, but really implementing that on a global scale, I think is vital. Can we really achieve sustainable development without the oil and gas companies, without the oil and gas expansion? Can the world really move on without them? And if yes, how? It's a critical question for our collective and shared future. There needs to be transition on ramps or off ramps, I should say. But yeah, the short answer to the question is can the world move forward without fossil fuel companies or in what way can we hit the goal with or without their engagement? The short answer is yes, that the world can move forward without fossil fuel companies having the power, the grip on decision makers and policies that these companies have had. What's really critical and what's needed is a collective commitment to the managed decline and phase down. And 
a reorientation of subsidies that are currently going to the fossil fuel sector. And if we've got these principles, those two are vital among them. I think certainly if we can go to the moon, yeah, then we can reorient our priorities and our focus and collectively align towards a path that for our shared future. Fossil fuel companies need to get out of the way and not subvert policies and try and leverage opportunities for every last drop. Honestly, I think that's what's critical and necessary. And if we can finance massive like to the tune of trillions of dollars, we can finance the restoration economy. We can find those solutions, pathways. And it's not easy to say, hey, let's transition all of these trillions in subsidies from a, a sector and industry that's pushing us off a cliff. That, that won't be an easy endeavor, but I think it's absolutely critical if we approach it in a way where we're really getting the solutions, the resourcing that they need, and we're clear about ending the fossil fuel expansion and countries and leaders committing to no new oil and gas licenses and banks and financial institutions committing to not financing expansion. I think it's completely doable. We have to make the commitment and then we have to not just talk about it. Our actions have to really be clear and true. Thank you so much for being our guest for this SDG Lurid cast. And I hope to speak to you soon again. Thank you so much for the opportunity and for your good work out there. Looking forward to a future conversation. And that was Tyson Miller of Earth Insight. What did we learn from this episode? First, there are serious threats to our vital ecosystems. The Amazon rainforest and the Congo Basin, rich in biodiversity and cultural significance, are under grave threat primarily due to the aggressive expansion of the oil industry. An alarming projection suggests potential quadrupling of areas in Africa targeted for oil and gas extraction, endangering the essence of the Congo Basin. Such expansions not only jeopardize the ecological sanctity of these regions, but also pose socio-economic challenges for the 35 million inhabitants within. Second, we also learned from this episode that there is an urgent need for decarbonization strategies. As nations grapple with escalating energy demands amid global geopolitical shifts, it becomes imperative to adopt robust decarbonization strategies. We explore the nexus between fossil fuel interests and global conservation commitments, underscoring the need for international dialogues on conservation. And lastly, Tyson highlighted potential solutions and reforms to counter these threats. Notably, the Fossil Fuel Non-Proliferation Treaty aims to halt fossil fuel expansion, while initiatives like the Moratorium on Industrial Activity in Primary Forests emphasize protecting primary forests. Financial reforms are also seen as a pivotal solution, with a push for banks to lead against fossil fuel expansion and for the redirection of subsidies towards restoration. You can find more of the SDG LearnCast on the UNSDG Learn website. For now, I'm Pauline Duman. Thanks for listening.